Britain to the fourth uh, broadcast in the EVA 25 series. Uh, we had uh, a really good um, session last week with Alistair Forbes, and uh, I'm welcoming uh, Christine, is it Dr. Christine Unter Hitzberger? And Hitzenberger? Hitzenberger. And uh, Roger Joby. Christine, um, I first met maybe about five years ago, um, and you may have been, maybe even longer, uh, maybe, you may have been working at Ernst & Young at the time, or the, 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 the last of that, and I think I grabbed you for a, uh, a, a session at, um, at the PMI Synergy um, Conference, and um, I remember you prowling around the stage at the Westminster Hall down in, in Westminster. So Christine is uh, currently a visiting professor at the University of Leeds and is engaged in all sorts and has interest in engaged in all sorts of uh, behavioural uh, and organisational research um, and is the, I think, the head of the chair for the research advisory panel for the APM currently or, or something like that for the, the last couple of years or so. Uh, something which I founded, incidentally. Couple of a few years back and encouraged its existence and joining her today in conversation is Roger Joby who again I've known for way too long um, maybe about 10 or 12 years it must be Roger I think uh, Roger is a project manager um, was silly enough to take a recommendation for Stephen Carver to look me up when he was interested in earned value and uh, is a major specialist in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, does an awful lot of work there in clinical research above all um, um, uh, 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 and promoting project management in those areas. So uh, today's topic is an interesting one. It's the uh, potentially rather dodgy relationship that there can be or very, very nice relationship that there can be between uh, contractors and their clients. Uh, and of course, we all know that they they always go very well. So, have we lost Roger? Did he, he no, seem to vaporise? Are you there still? Yeah, I'm here, me. Good. Okay, we'll come back. And um, so, Christine, I, I, I can't remember which one of you is kicking it off, but I'm assuming it's you, Christine. I, oh, if yes. it isn't, okay. Well, welcome, and um, off you go. Thanks. I'm going to disappear now. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for, for having us today. Um, Roger and I, as Steve said, are going to talk about the client-contractor relationship today. And we thought we are not going to do one of these presentations when you follow the slides, um, but make it a bit more interactive and um, have a conversation about um, a research we did together um, and also together with um, David Bride, who um, unfortunately can't join us today but um, yeah so Roger and I are going to have a conversation a discussion um, about our research and then um, at the end we also um, invite um, some questions from you of course. So Roger. Um, you can hear me thank you Christine. Yes. Oh good. Um, as I said we're going to talk about uh, the yeah. client contractor relationship today and especially to overcome agency issues. Um, how have you become interested in this topic or why, why were you kind of motivating and kicking off this research? Uh, well, I think, I think my interest really goes back quite a long way, really. Um, and I'll just give you a sort of little anecdote about what really sparked it off for me. Um, I was uh, working for a, a supplier, a CRO. So they're the people who do the research and are contracted by pharmaceutical companies to do that research. And we had two clients which we worked for. One was uh, a, a company called Cambridge Antibody Technology, who were a small biotech company. And the other one, I won't give you the name because they were a nightmare. Um, and I just remember uh, you know, looking at these two projects as they were going along and seeing that the, the Cambridge Antibody Technology one was going along really well. They had a, uh, a very uh, flexible approach to the contract. They, had, uh, they were constantly talking to our staff and uh, engaging with the staff. Actually, um, the problem with Cambridge Antibody Technology was they were good on drug discovery, but they were very poor on drug development. They didn't know what they were doing, really. So they 
really did come to us as being the experts and they asked lots of questions of us and uh, you know and it was a learning process for them um, so they very much left us to it they sort of said you know you get on with it you're the guys that know what you're doing um, you get on with it um, but they were very supportive and then on the other hand you had this other company which were very sort of micromanaging uh, constantly arguing about what we were doing and why we were doing it that way and I remember sitting in my office and having people knock on my door and saying, can you take me off this project? It's a nightmare. And can you put me on the on the Cambridge Antibody Technology one? Because it's so brilliant. And I thought that, you know, this is, you know, it's to do with how people are behaving that's making this difference. And, you know, one project was going really well and the other project was really going to hell in a handbasket. And I'd said, this must be just down to the people that were involved in. And, uh, and then we got, I got talking to Dave. Um, we started off by thinking that we would do some research into how earned value affected projects. And we started this with, um, we had two, um, two examples of construction projects and two examples of clinical research projects. Um, two of them went badly and two of them went really well. But um, earned value didn't seem to make any difference. To be fair, earned value did give you all the warning signs. It's just that in one particular example, they completely ignored the warning signs and just blamed their contractor for the, the mess that they were getting into. Uh, whereas with the other one, it was completely reverse. They saw the warning signs. They decided that their contract was not helping. So they changed the contract. They went back to their suppliers talk to them about how they wanted to implement earned value uh, and what it really meant to them and why it was important and got buy into how they were doing everything, which the other group didn't do at all. And of course, one worked and one didn't. So it was on the basis of that, I thought, you know, this is what we really want to be looking at. And we used those four projects for our paper. But the other interesting thing that struck me at the time is that, OK, I've got all this kind of anecdotal information that I've picked up saying, yeah, I know that's true. I know that happens. I know if you've got a rotten contract, it's going to be difficult. I know if you've got people that don't share information, you're going to have problems. Um, but it wasn't until I came to you guys uh, in, in the academic world that you said, well, there is a model that says, you know, there are models out there which we can put this information into. And I think it's really important that we codify this information because once we start putting it into a model, then you can start testing it. You can see, you know, does it work or not? And I think sort of over to you now, Christine, to talk perhaps a bit about um, principal agent theory, which is the actual uh, theory that we chose to, to use for that, that research. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Yeah, I think sometimes it suddenly makes so much sense when you see a model which explains what, what you're feeling and kind of discovering in the in the real projects, and you see a model which helps you to understand and explain what is happening and principal agent theory is really a very practical theory which is very relevant for our project world because it is concerned with the principal agent relationship where the principal is the client who contracts some work or outsources some work to the agent who is the contractor so two parties who have a relationship which is a very typical relationship in projects. And this relationship, as Steve said in the introduction already, is not always easy. It is a very complex relationship. Um, but there are reasons for it, because it's two different organizations. People come with a baggage to this relationship. So-called boundaries need to be overcome. We need to overcome organizational culture, individual interests, organizational interests, goals, and these boundary overcoming challenges um, lead to certain issues. And agency, principal agency theory um, basically states two issues, that there is on the one hand side the adverse selection problem, and the adverse selection problem relates to that one party has more information than the other party. And the so-called information asymmetry then means that one party is in a better position to make decisions, is in a better position to 
um, know what is really going on in a project. Often prior to a contract, the client has more information because they have worked with the project, they have developed the tendering documents potentially. So there is potentially more information on the client side, whereas often after the contract, this relationship turns and the contractor often has a lot more information about what is going on in the project where the client doesn't have access to. And this information asymmetry can then lead to mistrust because we don't know what is happening, we can't control, we don't have the insights what is happening. And that can then lead to a real spiral of detrimental behaviour. Um, and that is also related to the second issue, which is the moral hazard problem. And that's when actions take place which can't be observed by the principal. So you can't put it in a contract, you can't control it. And that happens in projects. There are loads of actions which you can't control um, as a principal. And again, this can lead to opportunistic behaviour, um, to concealment of information, and that leads to these then tensions in this principal agent relationship. So we have these two parties, principal and agent, and basically in a nutshell, each of them acts in their own best interest. That's what principal agency theory assumes. So each of them acts in the way that they get the most out of the project. And they exploit information asymmetry um, and then this leads to things like mistrust, concealment of information. And that's a real challenge in projects to then overcome these agency issues. So how do we overcome the mistrust? How do we overcome that we have this information asymmetry? How do we overcome this opportunistic behaviour that everyone acts in their own interest? Um, and this is what was part or then the focus of our study, um, where we said, what are the measures? Which mechanisms can we put in place to um, overcome these challenging issues in the client contractor relationship? And um, yeah, I'll hand over to you, Roger, because we have developed a model for that. Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, uh, and really, uh, what we did was we, we analyze these the four projects uh, um, and of course we're looking back at our own experience etc as well but we analyzed the four projects um, looking at uh, principal agent theory and saying you know is this an example of uh, asymmetry of information is there real issues here that you know that, that it's causing um, and uh, you know is there opportunistic behavior going on here and once you started doing that analysis, it was you know, really quite frightening, really. Um, just to give you one example, there was a, a project which was in haemophilia, uh, which is uh, a, a blood clotting problem. Uh, the patients are pretty rare and it's a difficult study to do, admittedly. But um, we started doing the analysis by just we interviewed people and just looked at what they said. And we were getting comments like, you know, this is a war between us and the <laughs> and the suppliers and the suppliers were saying exactly the same thing it was um, very antagonistic and uh, they were work with uh, withholding information because they said we don't want to give them this information because it's not very good information it's you know it's not saying that the project is not doing very well and what happens is we just get hit with a stick when we go and see them all of this sort of stuff was going on and you thought yeah, I can see where this is going. So we, we kind of analysed it like that. And then we looked at other projects. There was one which was a um, uh, to do with um, construction and it was a, a terminal building in an airport. And they they started off with a contract which was had lots of penalty clauses in it. They'd run it for about six months and they decided it wasn't working. You know, that people were just avoiding penalties and not getting the project done, if you know what I mean. So they scrapped it. And they went back and they came up with a, a different contract, which would had incentives rather than penalties. Um, they also did all sorts of other interesting things like they they um, they went and talked to their suppliers and said, what is actually really interesting for you? What is the key thing for you? What is your goal out of this project? 
And I said, well, actually, we want a successful project. But one of the key things for us is um, cash flow. And they said, OK, if cash flow is important to you. We'll make sure we pay you regularly and on time and everything. Um, and so all those sorts of discussions were going on. And um, we then sort of uh, crystallised all that down into sort of five main areas where we think it's really important uh, that you need to, to look at to overcome these, these problems of agency theory. First one is the contract. Um, and that's pretty obvious, really. Um, I, took, I think uh, I, when I first read the uh, NEC3 contract and I saw the bit about um, where it says, um, you know, if anything is likely to um, stop the project, uh, you know, make the project run over time or over budget or it's going to affect the quality, you need to bring it to the table straight away and put it into the risk register. I thought this is exactly the sort of thing that we're talking about. You need contracts that are going to help you, not hinder you. A lot of the contracts I look at, particularly in clinical research, they're nightmares, really. You, you just hope the project, nobody actually goes back to the contracts and tries to do anything with it because it's, it's so punitive. Um, so looking at the contract was an important uh, area that we thought of. Um, understanding this idea about making sure that people understand what you're doing it and why you're doing it. Um, you know, why you're employing earned value and why you're using this particular set of metrics to, to measure progress. And do you agree and are you happy about that? But all of that sort of stuff is, is really you know, fundamentally important as well. And of course, resource. Um, have you got the, the right sort of resource and have you got the right resort of resource that's going to be there at the right time? Again, it's a, another classic example that I've come across is the when you actually suddenly need somebody to, to write the report and they're on holiday for three weeks and things like that. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, a case of making sure that you have got the proper resource um, and it's not just the human resource, other resources as well, and they're there at the right time. And then there's the education part of it. Whereas, yeah, I mean, I think there are, you know, people do need to be educated on what the project is about. Um, I've been to no, numerous meetings and people actually don't understand what the project is for. And you think, well, how can they really get engaged with it if they don't understand what it's meant to be achieving? And then the last thing we came up with was delegation. Um, if you're going to employ somebody to do the work for you, there's no point in employing somebody you don't trust. Um, and if you know, that's just just ludicrous. Uh, and the it's a really big problem in clinical research because most pharmaceutical companies um, are very uh, uh, have done that, this this work in the past themselves, and they're just pushing it out for financial reasons rather than anything else. Um, so a lot of the people in, in in pharmaceutical companies think I can probably do this better than you can. You can, you guys. Um, but that's not really the attitude you should be taking. You should be saying these are the people that we've. Um, say they're going to do it. They know how to do these projects. Let's let them get on and do it. That doesn't mean to say you don't monitor what's happening and you haven't got, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of fallback as to you know, find out if there's issues. That's far from it. Um, and then that's an important uh, aspect of the understanding and the, and the contract and the education part as well. But we think these five areas uh, are the ones that uh, we can really concentrate and do some really uh, do something really positive about improving performance in in contracts um i think uh, christine you, you've you've been looking um not in a such in such a formal way as this but you've had a recent uh project that you've been looking at where you've noticed a lot of this sort of uh, positive work going on which is you know based around the cured the cured framework but um not specifically you know, part of the cured framework. Uh, I think it was a um, a contract, uh, a construction project in Germany. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, I worked with um, Merck on some research. Merck, uh, the one which is headquartered in Germany, the chemical and pharmaceutical company, not the one in the US. And um, they were basically interested to draw some lessons learned from their recent. Um, main project which was building a new innovation center 
And I had various conversations with them and how we could approach it and how to look at it and um, what are different opportunities. And the interesting thing which came out through these discussions was that there were actually exactly these five points um, which they had um, unconsciously addressed through actions they have taken in the project. And so we decided to, to write that up and um, wrote a teaching case study, which um, we also submitted to a competition and um, from the PMI and, and won the teaching case study award last year. Um, and it is basically uh, yeah, a description of the project, which challenges they occurred um, in one of the contractual relationships, which was with their main um, contractor, and which actions they took to actually overcome these um, points or, or these agency, agency issues. And yeah, it was really fascinating to see that is again exactly these five points which we had or these five mechanisms which we had um, initially identified through the research because for the research we obviously had five completely different case, uh, four completely different case studies which we used which um, which Roger said earlier and I think um, that's also the important point that it's with the with the case study research um, Roger said earlier we came up with these five mechanisms um, I cringe a little bit as a researcher when I hear that. I, we came up. <laughs> <laughs> because there was actually quite a rigorous process behind it um, in regards to um, the case study selection, why they were selected, that it's two industries which have, um, which typically enter these contractual relationships and projects, which have well-defined contracts and goals. Um, and then also the analysis um, quite detailed where Roger did a lot of work um, in the analysis in terms of um, within case analysis, cross case analysis. And then this shows that this rigorous process of actually working with these data, having the right case studies and working with these data then generates um, frameworks like the CURED framework, which are applicable beyond just the four case studies which we used, but then also really applicable and, and relevant um, for yeah the wider project um, project environment. And if you are interested, I'm just going to quickly put the link for the case study in the chat. Um, it should be accessible um, oops, on the website um, of PMI if you want to have a look. Um, and kind of a practical example of how the um, the framework is used. And that's also a question. I mean, I worked for 10 years in industry before I moved into academia. I'm now becoming a bit biased um, working in academia and, and um, uh, really valuing research. But I remember when I worked in industry, it was often that there was the assumption, yeah, that's theory. That's not really, that's not really how it works in projects. What do you think about that, Roger? I, well, I mean, I think um, I'm not quite sure I ever took, took quite that, that attitude. But um, what really impressed me about the whole process, in a sense, was that I'd made a series of observations over many years about what I thought was happening in projects. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I do uh, project management training and I was bringing more and more of this sort of what you might call soft skill training into my project management training. So I thought it was much more important than perhaps actually knowing the ins and outs of doing you know, risk analysis. Um, and but the, what I didn't do is I didn't work out how I was going to do anything with those observations. And the great thing about taking this sort of what I call a scientific approach to it is you've got observations out there and those observations, uh, you know, you've got a theory. And if the observations fit the theory, then the theory is, you know, acceptable. OK, observations may change and the theory may change. 
but we came up with a set of observations which fitted the, the theory really well. And then that generated a means of doing something about it, which is what I hadn't done for years. I just observed it and you know, done nothing about it. So I think this, this uh, you know, working with uh, an academic uh, organisation is, you know, was absolutely brilliant from my point of view, because we are now in a situation where we have got a, a process where we could go in and audit uh, companies and projects and say, this is where we think you could seriously improve your, your project performance by looking at the, the cured framework. Um, so from that point of view, I think it's been a, a very, very positive thing. And I, you know, I, I have heard people in the past say, research is research. This is a practical thing, project management. Well, everything benefits from proper uh, research that's you know, properly controlled uh, and, uh, and properly monitored. Yeah, yeah. And you are actually now working on um, getting that established in a standard, isn't, aren't you? Absolutely. Because my background is clinical research, um, anybody that doesn't know what clinical research is, it's the sort of final stage of drug development when you actually put the drugs into, into humans. Um, so it's those tests that we, we're looking at. Um, well, we've come up with a code of practice for clinical research based on the uh, on the cured framework um, and that's going to be launched uh, within the next few few days actually uh, and that's in conjunction with the um, uh, association uh, not the the um, uh, can't think of their name at the moment but it's in association with them <laughs> um, it'll come to me in a minute uh, so that's about to be launched uh, and on top of that we're also uh, looking to get some government funding to do some more research in this area because what we really want to do is get more data okay we've had four studies and we've had lots of our own observations in the past and we've had the work that christine's been doing in in germany but we really want to put a, a lot more data onto this so we can actually go and you know give people you know, really robust information about how they can improve their projects yeah and I think this is um, Institute also of Clinical Research. That's what I was searching for. Sorry. Yeah, and this is, I think, also what we what we set out today, isn't it? To have the conversation on the one hand side about our our research and what it produced with the cured framework, but also about the interaction between practice and theory and how it can inform each other and how it works together. And I think um, this topic and this piece of research has really developed into this kind of interaction um, and generated on the one hand side the academic publications which maybe give it a bit more I don't know credibility and, and rigor but then on the other hand and that's the really important thing um, the relevance to practice and the use in practice um, to improve projects and the performance of projects. Hmm. Yeah, good. And I think this is all the, the point when we maybe open okay, up to, to questions, questions. Yes. Thanks, right, Roger you. and Christine. Interesting topic. Uh, does anybody have a burning desire to answer ask the first question? Uh, I didn't have a um, a I'm more Simon, of a, is that yeah, you? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, go on. yeah, it was more of an observation, and I know I think Paul Kidson, you're on you're on the line here. It was more around my first, I guess, introduction into practical introduction to this is of Paul Kidston and myself at the time, London Underground. And Paul, you were I think the head of controls for Taylor Woodrow at the time, and we were talking about Tottenham Court Road. And I, I, I remember flippantly talking about you as, as my supplier and me as the client about how you were getting all this change into the contract. And I remember you turning around and quite briskly um, saying that we were, you know, you were looking at kind of one to two percent margins. So, you know, like if, if you were trying to get all that change for us, then clearly, do you know what I mean? Surely you should be making more profit. And I think it was the first time that I as a client had really kind of even tried to empathize with you know, with my partner, do you know what I mean, with my supplier in this space, and you, and you kind of really opened my eyes to the 
kind of like really what was going through your head. And, and I think from then on, I definitely took a different approach um, kind of to the way that I, I viewed suppliers and uh, other things. So, uh, Paul, yeah, he is obviously a load of people uh, would like to thank you, Paul, for making me a better person. So uh, that was, that was thanks, guys. <laughs> I've, been, I've been doing a lot of that over the years, Simon, as you know. <laughs> You're very good at it. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. <laughs> Yeah, and this is exactly the point of the, the understanding um, we have in the framework and also the contract. So the understanding of, um, Roger referred earlier, the understanding of what the project is, but also trying to generate the understanding of each other, Absolutely, of the motivations yeah. of each mm -hmm. other, of working with each other, what do we need, um, and kind of overcoming this inherent self-interest with what the two parties act um in this relationship yeah that's, and, a, that's absolutely true christina and i think that the, the light bulb for me was kind of having gone through that experience paul god knows how many years ago that was and then seeing this research kind of your work and, and then going oh oh okay actually this is what it is and it's kind of all written down and now i can understand <laughs> it but having that light bulb moment kind of really helped uh, help maybe see the view this is a really important bit of work to kind of get that common understanding approach so uh, it's really good yeah no great to hear yeah well, often people talk about the you know, what they want to do is try and align goals because you've got two organizations which got two different business models and you want to try and align the goals this can be sometimes quite difficult but one of the things that you can definitely do is understand what their goals are and try and accommodate them as much as possible, uh, which is, again, comes back to this idea of understanding what your supplier or what your client really wants. And, the, sorry. A, a question, um, within the model that you've developed, did you consider culture, sorry, organizational you, culture? Organizational you, culture. Sorry. Um, my video. There you go. Organizational culture as part of, first of all, understanding and then education. Um, so organizational culture isn't something, isn't kind of a mechanism which we can develop to overcome these situations. Or organizational culture is one of the boundaries which is which are there, which we need to um, live with, which we need to work with, and then there are the mechanisms we can use to overcome the boundary, which is, for example, to create the understanding, to create the education um, about what is the project for, but also which tools do we use in, in project so that or in the management of the project? How do we do the project control in the project? Do we all understand the same when we see certain numbers? So that's the education and the training and the use of the um, tools, techniques, which are present in the project, um, so that it's not only the background we come from, from our own organization, but that we generate um, kind of a project culture um, through the understanding, through the education, um, which we bring into the project. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense to me because it goes back to my original thoughts about Cambridge Antibody Technology, where the the whole team was like one team. You couldn't distinguish between the Chrome Medica people, which were the suppliers, and the and the um, Cambridge Antibody Technology people. They were in one team, whereas the other one were like two tribes warring against each other. Okay, thanks, Raj. Uh, Bob, you got a question? Um, yes, my background's in construction, but I presume that in both disciplines, yours and mine, at the end of the day, there's a budget, and and, yeah. and that might be fixed. Do you have a view as to where the best place to hold the contingency is, whether it might be your contractors or whether the client should hold it, and and how one should proceed in the management of the budget, or is the project doesn't it have a but uh, a contingency? And you didn't then have to argue because no one can afford to do anything that wasn't originally estimated. Uh, do you, well, do you recommend terms, where a contingency should be held? In terms of clinical research, um, 
it's a bit of an odd sort of uh, situation uh, because up until relatively recently, the pharmaceutical company was awash with money. So um, nobody sort of terribly worried much about contingency budgets because if push came to shove, they'd find the money to do it anyway. But that, that, that atmosphere has changed now. And it's uh, and my, my personal view is I like to see contingency linked to risk. Um, so uh, as long as it is linked to a genuine risk and used for that genuine risk, then I've got some sympathy with it. There was a classic example in, in my industry of a, a company, a mid-sized pharmaceutical company, that put a uh, contingency budget out there, uh, which you made available to the supplier over a five-year project, and they spent it all in the first nine months. Um, I mean, I think, you know, you've got to be careful about that sort of thing. Um, but the other thing that you've got to take into account is the uh, the level of certainty you've got with your project. If you go to phase three clinical research, there is quite a high level of uncertainty about you meeting your timelines and your budget anyway. Um, you're relying on patients to be available uh, as and when you want them. Um, they're like third parties, then they're, they're not, you can't control them. Actually, the people that recruit those patients, you can't control them either because they're doctors from hospitals. So you've got a massive amount of uncertainty. So um, I generally think it's better like lying with the client rather than the uh, supplier. But um, um, I, yeah, I, it's, it's just got to be really flexible, I think, certainly in clinical research anyway. OK, thank you. I, I'd agree with that. Um, and I think and that's often the difficult thing in in project management, isn't it? You can't definitely say that's right, that's the right or the wrong way to do. It often it depends on the project, on the um, parties involved, on what's written in the contract, um, all these things. That's why we have the the topic of contractual completeness in there. It might even not be the right thing that what you decide at the beginning that it's the right thing for the project, but then to recognize it and to, if necessary, amend it, um, change it if you see it isn't working. Um, but as a tendency, I would say it is with the client, but it is really dependent on the circumstances of the project. OK, thank you. Thanks, Bob. I was just seeing if I could put my hand up, and I, I will. Um, it's an it, it's interesting because it's a way of um, being able to understand and articulate a, a, um, a situation, perhaps. The question, the skeptic in me asks, um, why? Um, what are the tangible benefits? You know, wh why should my organisation take um, cognizance of, 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 of this framework, the cured framework, and what, what's in it for, I don't know, my side of the organisation in terms of, of gaining this understanding? And how does that, how, how does that convert into um, tangible, measurable improvements? Um, uh, and b before you answer, you know, a couple of thoughts have sprung to mind. When I, th 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 there's the, the world we live in of business where we're nice to each other, not because we like each other, but because you've got some money and we want to earn it. Um, I'd go in as a consultant or as a, uh, I, I ran uh, uh, software projects. And my main aim, as far as my employer was concerned, was to be told, they've paid for a thousand hours, go and burn those hours as fast as you can without any necessary um, provision of, of deliverable there. Uh, more full the IT industry at that point, you know, quite a while ago, but they were, they, everything was related to hours rather than to, to deliverables. And um, there are other areas where one deals with companies who make their reputation and their basis by being relatively cutthroat and unfriendly. 
you know, I, I worked in an FMCG environment for a few years, printing, and one of our major suppliers in FMCG was Tesco's. And as long as there's nobody from Tesco's here, Tesco's were awful to deal with. You know, they, 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 they screwed you through the floor um, to do business with them. And there was no principal agent theory or, or, or no reason on their part to improve relationships. It was more a question of take it or leave it, you know, and, 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 and get on with the work, um, we, which often meant for some very sour situations. But by, on, by the same token, we knew exactly where we were with each other. Um, so it's, it, it, you know, there, there's some ambiguity and, and some undoubted, and I shy away from the term, some undoubted co complexity within this kind of framework. You know, how, how do you use it as a tool to bring about beneficial change? Um, might, might be the question. Is it, can things be done that way? Oh, I think they certainly can, Steve. And we are pressing forward with that uh, at breakneck speed, if you like. Of looking at how we are going to go in there and, and make a difference. Uh, we have uh, specifically chosen the clinical research environment to start this off in because the key thing almost for all pharmaceutical companies is to get their drug to market as quick as possible. And we think by introducing some of the stuff that we're talking about in the earned framework, in the uh, cured framework, sorry, is we can uh, actually uh, cut down the time it takes to do some of these studies uh, and that is mega dollars for them um, uh, and so there's massive benefits in the pharmaceutical industry uh, which is the, the one I'm more familiar with actually but um, I think there are uh, substantial benefits and we're, we're looking at collecting data we're looking at collecting data and modifying this um, the framework and we're not saying that this is setting tablets of stone by any stretch of the imagination we're going to look at how, how this goes as the more projects and the more information we get we may well be changing our view or modifying our view on this it's going to be a living sort of uh, framework uh, and uh, we're hoping that people sort of will buy into it will give us their information so that we can feed back you know what is happening on a much wider field for you know for their benefit and i think um just in addition to that um like there's kind of a spectrum. On the one hand side, there's the principal agent relationship or agency relationship, which is that everyone acts in their own interest. On the other side of the spectrum is the so-called stewardship relationship, which is that we act more in the common interest, um, but not um, like in a community kind of sense, but in kind of the common interest of the project, still with everyone has their needs to survive economically etc but that um there is less of this um, opportunistic behavior and um other research not by us um has shown that organizations and individuals have some stance on this spectrum you you brought an example where someone was very much on the um agency um relationship spectrum if a client and a contractor come together, are not aware of these, of the spectrum of the different behaviors, they come together, enter the relationship with their predisposition, um, start to work together. If one is on the stewardship side, the other one is on the agency side, this relationship simply won't work because they don't talk to each other. They talk a different language. They one party will be disappointed. One party will most likely be financially harmed as well. You said um, we knew what we get every time. So both of you kind of probably entered with an agency relationship approach. So you both knew where, where you were at. Mm -hmm. That's why it worked. But it's not very often that then the two agencies really come together and that it works. Um, usually it is that one party in this relationship then is in some way damaged. Mm -hmm. And um, if we get this understanding of how we can reduce this damage, we can generate also more long-term relationship 
um, which then allows potentially future work, which allows a more sustainable um, business to develop. And just one last point on the contract where you mentioned burn the thousand hours as quickly as you can. Agency theory also has a view on the contract um, because the different contracts do, do play a role. Um, it differentiates between the outcome based contract and the behavior based contract. And that again comes back to the information asymmetry. The contract on based on hours would be the behavior based contract and you can burn the hours mm -hmm. because of the information asymmetry, because the client can't actually check exactly what you do during these 1000 hours. So with this, if the client doesn't have the chance to check, which is often the case where you don't work together that closely, the contractor potentially acts opportunistically in the best interest of him or herself and burns the hours. Whereas if you had an outcome based contract with a fixed price where you have to deliver something, then it is more likely that the contractor will act in the best interest of the client if there is this big information asymmetry. Yeah. If you put measures in place to overcome this, then a behavior based might be better. Mm -hmm. So to, to gain those, or to have that as part of the the kind of tool set that, that, that somebody who is governing an organization or trying to set the, the tone, the, the culture for an organization, where, where do you place this stuff? And as I said, is there some kind of um, uh, process map or, or, or are you seeking to, to, to develop some kind of process route map on, on, on how you could take a look at organizations, um, figure out where they were um, with cured analysis and, th and then figure out what it is that they they might need to do in order to be able to work more productively to be not not productively together but to be more aligned maybe to be more congruent in, in terms of more fully understanding that you know there are areas where, where if, if, if they um, innovated the way they work together or, or they lined up more, 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 more perfectly that it would be in their joint mutual interest you know in terms of as I said that better efficiencies, more profitable work, um, you know, reduction of cost, that sort of thing. Um, do, do you have that in mind as the step before, you know, a, 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 as a kind of set of outcomes arising from the research you're doing? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we've got that kind of in place almost already that we could go in and audit um, <clears throat> an organisation or their projects and then make recommendations about what we think you ought to be doing to make this work better. Um, so, yeah, we've already got that process uh, in place, uh, more or less. Uh, what we need, you know, and, and that the code of practice uh, that we're doing for the clinical research people uh, incorporates that, that idea of that, you know, we're going to go in and we can go in and look at your organisation mm -hmm. and say, based on the um, cure framework, this is what we think you need to do. But then we're going to measure whether it has a real effect or not. Uh, and you know, so we, we're going to start collecting data to say, well, actually, yeah, this was right, or this wasn't actually what we thought it was either, and there's something else going on. So we, you know, it's going to be a fairly dynamic thing, I think, to begin with, at least. And uh, but that's that's exactly what we want to do, yeah. Yeah, Christine. Yeah, and I think it is on the one hand side, it's it's the audit and checking and um, how organisations and how it is implemented in projects. And on the other hand, it is about kind of generating a bit of a mindset shift and the awareness of how these things are actually connected. Um, and it's about kind of every individual involved in projects also taking responsibility for that and gaining the, the understanding that it is these information asymmetries, for example, where I try to keep everything as closely to myself and don't share anything um, with my client, uh, with my client or with my contractor. That these approaches are actually harmful, and what are the consequences of that? So, mm. on the one hand side, it's the more organizational process roadmap to develop, and on the other hand, it is the kind of shift in mindset and really um, gaining the individual understanding um, 
of the connections which are there, I think. Yeah, uh, well, um, I, I agree. I still think it's a fairly massive challenge. You know, I'm thinking of the recovering alcoholic here. Uh, not, not that I am one um, yet, but uh, I, I'm thinking that the, the recovering alcoholic, the road to recovery or the road to cure is to admit that they have a problem. Right. And in, in yeah. a lot of relationships, and I'm also thinking, you know, I'm, something called transactional analysis is screaming at me here, too, at the moment which is which one of the, in many relationships, everybody knows there's a problem, but it's always the other person. Yeah? And, and, and so to, 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 to bring these together and to get, I don't know, the governing board or body of a, an organization to, to actually realize that there's a problem, which were they but to fix it, could be to their advantage as well as to the way that they conduct their business and a whole variety of things, strikes me that you really have to take these ideas and principles in at the very highest of levels in an organization amongst some people who are also there setting the tone for that organization. And that, you know, there are some fairly large road to Damascus moments that they're going to have to go through to to, to, to get to the, the stage that they say, well, let's do something about it. You know, there, there, there really is a problem or there is something worth working at to to improve the general lot. Um, but uh, it, it's interesting stuff. So I shall look forward to you releasing the um, the, uh, the tool set, I think, that, 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 that accompanies this as much as anything else. And if, if possible, gathering some some tangible um, uh, figures of, of, of potential gains that, that organizations can can do, because I think it's, it's absolutely vital in, in selling this idea in inverted commas that people say, well, you know, if we get if we get gains of one, two, three, ten percent in certain areas, that, that, that makes people prick their ears up, even if they aren't at heart behavioral scientists or, or, or researchers. And that's always the challenge with research. Right. So I'm, so I'm going to have to. Uh, ask you if you've got any concluding remarks before before I bring these proceedings to to a close because I think we could go on talking about it for a long time but I'm mindful of the time. Mm -hmm. Christian well, and Roger, I, anything to say? Well, I just uh, I've got a sort of an analogy which I quite like. I don't know whether anybody else will sort of get it in the same way that I have. Um, is that um, if you look at cricket, for instance, you've got a set of laws which govern how you play cricket. But it doesn't tell you anything about the results of what happens on the field. Um, I think that we are now in, in, in terms of the cured framework, we're looking at what happens on the field rather than things like the body of knowledge or Prince <clears throat> 2, which is really a set of rules about how you play the game. So I think that we're, we're going into a sort of a completely different sort of area. And you're right that we are going to need to get into the high level of these organisations. But um, what's the alternative to sit back and do nothing? Well, I don't think that's really an alternative for us. No, that's right. Christine? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Roger. And sometimes it's baby steps we are taking. And I, I don't think that we claim that this is the, um, the silver bullet. I think it is yeah. one piece in the jigsaw <coughs> of... Um, contributing to um, better performance, better outcomes of our projects and adapting it um, so that it works for you. And yeah, that's kind of my closing remark, I think. Okay. Well, that, that segues, segues quite, quite neatly into, you've got another slide, haven't you? You're, 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 you're touting for people yes. to contribute to the research you're doing. Uh, and again, you know, the chicken and egg the theory here is if you don't do the research, you don't you don't convert practice into uh, uh, instruments that can change policy and, uh, and in consequence affect, affect practice. So um, I know that there are some areas surrounding this. Do you just want to put that slide up briefly? Um, yes. Don't forget to uh, pull a moment to gather his thoughts. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I would... Um, like to make you aware of a few studies I'm currently working on and invite participation if any one of you is um, interested. Um, this is going to be sent around after the meeting as well, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm currently working on three topics. Um, one is governance of inter-organizational project networks, which has very much a focus on um, yeah, how can we 
generate more long-term working together in networks and how is this governed how is it how does it come up how does it work what are the mechanisms which are used um, another one is um, where i've just very recently got funding from the apm um, organizational justice in projects um, where i'm conducting a diary study um, and the third one is digital communication and stress so looking at um, what's the impact of digital communication, which we're all doing a lot now, um, on project managers and how do they cope with it. Um, so yeah, if anyone is interested and would like to spare an hour for an interview or get involved in the diaries, um, I've also included my contact details. Um, please feel free to get in touch um, and it would be great to do some work and then um, share it in some way or another again uh, in a forum like that or also in your organization. Okay. Right, well, as Christine said, we'll be circulating that. So, so thanks, Roger and Christine. Um, we shall, again, hopefully as you proceed, there'll be opportunities to come back and, and bring us up to, to, to speed on where you're at. So, Paul, are you ready, sir? I'm ready, Steve. Uh, Roger, Christine, really liked uh, what you had to say and i like the uh, co combo of um christine and roger you sound like you are partners on strictly come dancing okay <laughs> which is cool um so yeah uh, i liked your analogy roger i've gone down a slightly different analogy route this poem about what has just been said is called the dodgy but nice relationship between contractors and clients aka the language of earned value love. On the one hand, they're a dream, constantly talking, effortlessly engaging, looking the part. On the other, they're a nightmare, micromanaging on a trip to hell in a wee handcart. Earned value gives the warning signs. Principle is the client. It's like a first date that wants to move on to love and marriage. One part is in a better position, but one has baggage. The client has the information and is all loving and giving. The contractor is swept off its feet, but then the honeymoon is over and the update flowers are from the garage. Levels of information goes from gourmet to takeaway, opportunistic behavior that looks cosmopolitan, but it's really suburbia. Over budget, over time, overpaid and over here. Contract understanding, resources, education, delegation, time to be cured and clear. With all these in place, you can say, yes, my dear. As Barbara Streisand sang, you don't bring me update flowers anymore. When the five points will bring back the l'amour. Well, enough is enough. If you want to see the project in the buff cross case analysis, is very applicable. And once again, it will make both parties lickable. It's all about a framework frame of mind. And in the right critical research measure, you have to be cruel to be kind. For both contractor and client to truly understand each other and move on from first date to lover, then they've got to understand the goals and live and let live. And if ultimately, they can't love you, you can't love the one you want, then love the one you're with. <coughs> well done. Cool. That was short. <laughs> it was an, it was an epic. There was, wealth, there was a wealth of information. Christine, yeah. and I hope you know this. I'm wearing my Leeds United shirt because I know yeah, you're at the University of Leeds. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. You're from up that way, Paul, aren't you? Well, thank you, Paul. I shall look forward to seeing the parchment on that um, and we'll we'll issue that in a day or so. Um, you can so, issue it. Uh, I'm sending it to you now. You can issue oh, it in the you. next day. I, I, I'm astonished at the, the. Well done. Um, right. Uh, a, a few notices. We will be circulating uh, the actual paper that, that, that Christine and Roger has uh, have worked on as well as the request for, for, for research advice. Um, 
I sent out an announcement earlier this week um, requesting help on the development of the route map diagram for the uh, British standard on project controls. Uh, as yet, nobody's come rushing back to me saying, I'd really love to help out on that, Steve. Um, so the request goes out again. If you missed the announcement, um, to briefly, um, I, I need a route map uh, overview diagram of the landscape of project controls that we can insert at the front end of the project control standard so that people can understand a way of navigating their, their, their path through the document, but also get a rough idea of what, what the world of project controls looks like. So anybody who's uh, wants to stitch the contents list onto this diagram and, and, and make it um, uh, play correctly would be most welcome to get in touch quite soon. Um, we are endeavouring to bring the first draft of that document uh, um, uh, into touch by the end of the year. So there's only a few weeks left to, to get there. Now, uh, there is, fortunately, unfortunately, um, I anticipated half term next week. So there will be a, a brief pause whilst um, uh, there is no program scheduled for next week. When we meet again on the 5th of November, fireworks night, um, there will be a, a minor alteration to the, the schedule and the speaker uh, for that evening, for those of you that were on the session last week with Alastair, will have noticed somebody called Martin Paver asking a few questions. Martin Paver is uh, a leader in the world of data analytics and uh, was scheduled to speak a bit later in the year, but we pulled it forward to fireworks night. So he and I will be engaged or I will be engaging him in conversation so that he can account for himself and uh, tell us why data analytics is either set to take over the world or is just the latest fashion. Um, so I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion with him on that. Um, this hiatus ne next week, it does occur to me, whilst we no have no meeting scheduled, if one of you were minded to uh, lead an impromptu discussion themselves uh, next, Friday, next Thursday, I'd be more than happy to, to promote that and, and, and put that up there if you wanted to bring a group of people together to maybe hear some ideas or or just take the stage. Uh, but but if you do, then please get in touch uh, tonight or tomorrow so that I can uh, endeavour to, to arrange something to film next Thursday with. Uh, other than that, I think we are um, just over time and uh, I hope to see you all again, if not next week, then on the 5th of November, Martin Paver. And remember, we may have a new American president. Might be the same one, might be not. Might have to take a leaf out of Paul's book and love the one you're with. We'll see. I wonder how, where he fits in uh, in principal agent theory. Anyway, <laughs> something to look forward to, everybody. So uh, on that note, thank you and goodbye.